Saturday afternoon and time to drop in at the Sportsman Club for another of the favorite sports stories of Grantland Rice. Yes, every Saturday afternoon is yarn spinning time down at the Sportsman's Club where the fans gather as guests of the Dean of American Sports Writers, Grantland Rice. Granny Rice, who has covered all the big sporting events of the past 30 years, has made a hobby also of collecting good stories about sports. You're all invited to these sessions of the Hot Stove League, so come along now as we meet the fans of Grantland Rice. That's all right, but I don't care what you say. I don't think the mile will ever be done yes, in four minutes. I know minutes. it can someday, and some fellow's going to come along and do it. Oh, I don't think... It. There's Grantland Rice now. Hi, you, Granny. Hi. Hello, fellas. Say, Granny, uh, what do you think of Arnie Anderson? You mean that uh, human motorcycle who turned in a record-shattering 406 in the mile this week? Yes, in that race yeah. at Malmo, Sweden. Well, the four-minute mile has long been a golden dream of the track fans, as we all know, and it looks sure to become a reality now. The way that 28-year-old Swedish schoolteacher has been breaking records lately, he may do a four-minute mile yet. Well, I sure is fast. Well, what's the yarn for us today, Granny? Today I have a golf story for you. Frank Bunce wrote it for the Saturday Evening Post several years ago, and he called it Four. Well, let's hear it, Granny. Well, you all know Mrs. Preston. She is a drill sergeant type of club woman. You know, who takes herself and her golf very seriously, and who believes in the strict interpretation of all the rules of golf, especially where those rules will give her the advantage. Now, most of the time, the Mrs. Prestons have their own way, riding rough shot over all opposition. Once in a while, however, they meet an adversary who will give them blow for blow. Such was the case in today's story, when Mrs. Preston literally took a bab of the tail when it comes to mangling the rules of golf. So uh, let's drop in on Mr. Stander, the veteran club steward who acted as referee in this classic battle. My name is Stander. Uh, Mr. Stander, I've been the steward of the Meadowbrook Golf Club for the past 15 years, and I can tell you that nothing like this ever happened before. Our management frowns upon promiscuous publicity and any kind of sensational behavior. So naturally, all the members observed strict decorum on the course. Even Mrs. Preston, who always made certain everyone knew how important she was, never displayed her pugnacity in the open. Uh, that is, until the day in July, when, grown sullen with a sense of her importance, she attempted, in the words of a new member, a Miss Dorrit Bly, to uh, push Miss Bly around. Uh, on the afternoon of that day, I was casting up my accounts when Mrs. Preston barged into my office. Mr. Sander. Oh, yeah. yes, Mrs. Preston, did you wish to speak to me? Mr. Sander, either that girl or I must leave this club. It isn't big enough for both. Uh, what girl, Mrs. Preston? That, that new member, Miss Bly. The blonde one wearing the atrocious red shirt and shorts. Red shorts? Oh, 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 uh, Miss Bly. Uh, just a minute, I'll look her up, Mrs. Preston. Now, B, C, B, L. Oh, yes, yes. Miss Dorrit Bly, secretary to Claremore and Kaplan attorneys. Application for membership received last week in conjunction with the application of a Miss Laura Weldon, a friend. Approved Wednesday. Formal notification forwarded to them yesterday. Huh. Now, this must be their first day on the course. <laughs> it's obviously their first day on any course. I want you to take this matter up at once. Why, what seems to be the trouble, Mrs. Preston? Well, to begin with, early this afternoon, they, uh, that Miss Bly and her friend, appeared in the clubhouse wearing shorts and shirts of a brilliance and brevity that I can only describe as sensational. Really? I, I should like to have seen, a, seen that uh, spectacle. Really, Mr. Stanley? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I meant, of course, that I should have warned them that it's against our rules to appear partly clothed. Exactly. I remonstrated with them reminding them of the club rule which specifies that no member shall enter any public room unless properly clothed, and giving them their choice of either leaving instantly or donning more suitable apparel. Yes, quite so, Mrs. Preston. And uh, did they put on more suitable apparel? They did not. They chose to leave. And then this Miss Bly had the temerity to indulge in a spiteful reference to my clothes. She did? She said... 
Oh, she said I ought to be worth a fortune to somebody as a, uh, an antique. She said that to you? She did. That's terrible. Absolutely inexcusable, Mrs. Preston. But that isn't all. Later, while striking a ball around the course by myself, I came on the pair again. They had only one set of clubs and no caddy, which was enough by itself to slow up their game, without regard to this Miss Bly's eccentric method of play. Eccentric, uh, Miss Bly? In what way, Mrs. Preston? She assumes a completely unorthodox stance, and then just stands over the ball, gazing into space, waiting, as she explains it, for the right harmonic impulse. The uh, right harmonic impulse? Not really. I demanded to be allowed to go through their match. But this Miss Bly had the audacity to refuse me, asserting that while I might be big potatoes around the clubhouse, as a single player on the course, I had no standing under the rules. No standing? You... Exactly. Well, she only meant, of course, that under a strict interpretation of rule one of golf, you had no right to go through their match. Well, being a new member, she could hardly be expected to know who you are. And she must find out at once. Yes, I'll talk to her, Mrs. Preston, right away. <laughs> I'm sure that I can effect a peaceful settlement of your controversy. <clears throat> uh, are you Miss Bly, our new member? Yes. Are you Mr. Stander? Yes, Miss Bly. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, um, there's a small matter... Before you begin, Mr. Stander, there are a few things I want to take up with you. I have a bill of complaint to submit about the course. Bill of complaint? At T's 2 and 7, the front markers should be corrected to line them exactly at right angles to the line of play as recommended by the Rules Committee of the United States Golf Association. Golf Association? Also, hole nine is only three and seven-eighths of an inch deep. One-eighth of an inch shallower than the accepted standard. Shallower than accepted standard? Also, none of your water hazards are properly defined with white lines, as the Rules Committee likewise recommends. Water hazards? Are... I know because I have read through not merely all the rules of golf, but the entire body of decisions and recommendations under them. And there's no possibility that I'm in error because I remember everything I read. My employers, Mr. Claremore and Mr. Kaplan, say I have a memory that would make an elephant commit harakiri in despair and shame. Oh, an, an elephant committing harakiri? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Very good. Mr. Sanders, <laughs> I stood this nonsense long enough. Have you forgotten our purpose in coming out here? No, Mrs. Preston. I mean, of course, Mrs. Preston. I, I'm just coming to that. Miss Bly, I, I, I'm not questioning the accuracy of your memory. The changes you recommend will be given attention as soon as possible. And for the moment, however, uh, suppose we confine ourselves to reconciling your differences with Mrs. Preston. There aren't any differences as far as I'm concerned. Really? Well, there are as far as I'm concerned. Please, Mrs. Preston, I must hear both sides to make an impartial decision on your charges. Go ahead, Miss Bly. Well, if you must know... This afternoon, when we first arrived, we went up to the clubhouse to look around and show a friendly spirit, and I might add, to see whether there were any good-looking men around. Oh, yes, naturally. <laughs> However, when Mrs. Preston objected because we were not dressed like Gibson girls, we left without argument, except for a remark or two in self-defense. Self-defense, indeed. Calling me an, an antique. I still consider that an understatement. Oh, you do? Well, you listen to me, young lady. Just because please, you... Please, please, Mrs. Preston. I must hear both sides to make an impartial decision. Remember, we're on the golf course. I shall never forget it. Go ahead, Miss Bly. Later, she followed us out here to the golf course and renewed the attack. I felt it necessary to put her back in her place. Nobody can keep pushing me around and get away with it. So there's nothing to reconcile that I can see? She's right on that. I don't want reconciliation. I will accept nothing less than her immediate expulsion from the club. On what grounds? Why, why, uh, on the grounds, uh, that you delay play. I can testify that you take anywhere from two to five minutes to stroke your ball. And it happens to be a rule of this club, young lady, that no member shall unduly delay play. Hey, George, come here. This is good. It's a rule of any club. It's rule ten of the section devoted to the etiquette of golf. However, if you're going to make a mere rule of etiquette grounds for expulsion, 
You'll have to expel yourself also for violating Rule 1 of the same section. I? Yes, you. You chose to make your protest about my method of play at a time when I was engaged in stroking a ball. And the rule says that no one shall move or talk or stand close to or directly behind the ball when a player is making a stroke. Hey, the blonde is good. Yeah, nice figure, too. She's sure making a monkey. Miss Bly, I repeat what I told Mr. Stander. Either you or I must leave this club. Them's my sentiments, but I'll take the blonde. I demand that you take some action immediately, Mr. Stander. Please, Mrs. Preston, you're attracting a gal. I have nothing to be ashamed of. And if you won't do anything about it, I will. It so happens, Miss Bly, that we have a rule at this club which specifies that when any two members disagree and are unable to settle their difference otherwise, they shall transfer their quarrel to the links, the loser to resign from the club. Since you seem so concerned with the rules, suppose you meet me under those conditions, say, tomorrow at three. Hey, that's not fair. A veteran challenging a novice on terms like that? Well, Miss Bly, I'm waiting for an answer. I'll play you, Mrs. Preston. But I want it distinctly understood that the match will be conducted in accordance with the rules as expounded by the Rules Committee of the USGA, and not just according to your private notions of what they ought to be. I want a marker on hand and an impartial referee. Mr. McTrevor and Mr. Stander ought to do as well as anybody. Oh, please, uh, you see... Uh... Mr. Stander will be a satisfactory referee, I'm sure. Very well. Oh, please, uh, we ought not to rush into this impetuously. Before such a match is played, there are several things to be decided. Uh, for instance, the matter of handicap. I'm willing to be reasonable. I'll allow Mrs. Preston a few holes, say, um... Say six. Oh, well, she may have spunk, but she certainly doesn't have sense. You don't understand, Miss Bly. It's Mrs. Preston who should be handicapped. You're a beginner. She's a strong player, one of the club's best. That's right, miss. Make her give you the handicap. Why, only last year she beat a famous star, a man. I don't think you need worry, Mr. Stander. She won't be playing a man tomorrow. <laughs> That retort, with all its interesting implications, was quoted and discussed zestfully in the locker rooms that day. And when Miss Dorrit Bly and Mrs. Preston met at the first tea next afternoon, they found the fairways cleared and a few curious onlookers around. To a man, they favored Miss Bly, though their choice was purely sentimental. Nobody expected her to win. Uh, good luck, Miss Fly. Don't forget, we're rooting for you. Thanks, boys. Mr. Stander, will you please silence the gallery? Oh, yes, Mrs. Preston. Uh, quiet, please. Miss Bly is teeing off. Go ahead, Miss Bly. Shh. Oh, too bad. Oh, in the rough. It's tough luck. All right, Mrs. Preston. Quiet, please. <laughs> Four. Hey, look. Her ball struck the post and bounded back. Oh, wonderful. That lie will cost her several extra strokes. Oh, I guess that blonde Miss Bly got in her hair all right. Hey, wait a minute, Bill. She's picking up her ball and reteeing it. Huh? What the devil's the old bird up to now? Mrs. Preston, I don't quite understand you're taking another drive. Original ball unplayable. My privilege under the rules. Player's sole judge of when ball is unplayable. Oh, well, can you beat that? Well, she's technically right, of course, but you... I Quiet, don't... please. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Oh, nuts. Straight down the fairway. <laughs> Well, of course, with two drives, Mrs. Preston took the first hole. She drove poorly again from the second tee, but played a provisional ball against the possibility of the tee ball being lost. Then judged the ball unplayable. And she drove two balls on the third hole, accepting the penalty. All this time, Miss Bly made no comment whatsoever. Using so many strokes, nobody bothered to count them. Well, meanwhile, Mrs. Preston, notoriously a distance chiseler, teed well up... Uh, beyond the front markers. But Miss Bly seemed unaware of this fact. At least she made no protest. She lost the third hole, then the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. Then, suddenly, her manner changed abruptly. Well, that's your six holes, Mrs. Preston. Of course they're mine. I've taken every one by at least a dozen strokes. I meant those are the six holes I promised you as a handicap. From now on, we're playing golf. I beg your pardon? Don't bother. Just... Go ahead and play. Hmm. 
of all the impertinence. Oh, uh, you'll have to move that ball back about six inches and take your penalty. You teed ahead of the markers as you've done on most of the other holes. Now you're talking, Blondie. That was a good shot. Well, I hope you're satisfied, Miss Sly. Mm, I am. But you'd better have your caddy return that ball. It's a long walk there and back. Return it? Huh, I'll do no such thing. You'll have to under the rules. I told you we were starting to play golf now. And Section 2 of Rule 2 says that if any player plays a ball from outside the limits of the teeing ground, the ball may be at once recalled by the opposing side and may be re-teed without penalty. I'd suggest that next time you drive, you don't hit so hard. And why not? She's wonderful. Because it will have to be reteed again from in front of the teeing ground, and I'll just call it back again. It's still being stroked from an out of bounds lie, and it's still a tee shot, no matter how many times you hit it or how many times I call it back. Isn't that right, Mr. Standard? I, I'm afraid so, Mrs. Preston. I realize this may seem a bit absurd, but I see no other possible decision under the rules. I'm sorry, Mrs. Preston. Do you mean to tell me I've got to stand here driving balls off this tee all afternoon? No, you can't do that. You'd be unduly delaying play, and you could be expelled from the club. You said so yourself yesterday. If you ask me, I'd say your best way out would be to refuse to return the ball, thus forfeiting the hole under the penalty of Clause 3, Rule 2. <laughs> Very well. I shall forfeit the hole. But you mark my word, young woman. You'll be sorry for this. We shall see, Mrs. Preston. We shall see. On the eighth hole, Miss Bly began to play her harmonic system. But instead of gazing into space and waiting for the right harmonic impulse, she focused her attention upon Mrs. Preston's ankles. And this may have accounted for the fact that though her drive was bad, Mrs. Preston's was worse. Mrs. Preston played a provisional ball and then finding that the tee ball lay so badly as to make playing it a bad risk, decided to go on stroking the provisional ball. Miss Bly immediately picked up her own ball and started for the ninth tee. My hole. I beg your pardon? I said my hole. Really? I'd like to know why. I deemed my tee ball unplayable and continued with my provisional ball, as provided in Rule 22. You seem to forget that the rule makes the player sole judge of whether his ball is unplayable. Oh, you're the one that's forgetting something. You forget seven little words. Except as provided in Rule 27, with which the rule you quote begins. Rule 27, in case you don't remember, deals with water hazards and casual water. My ball did not go into a water hazard. There's no water hazard on this hole. No, but it's in casual water, see? You lose this hole as provided in the penalty clauses of both rules 22 and 27. And you're going to lose every other hole from now on whenever you try that nice little trick of driving two balls if you don't like the lie of your tee ball, even though you take the penalty. It rained yesterday, Mrs. Preston, in case you've forgotten. And any ball you drive will create its own casual water when it comes to rest. Why, this is absolutely ridiculous. It's unfair. Mr. Stander... What have you to say about this? I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Preston, but I'm afraid that you've lost the hole. From that moment on, Mrs. Preston went to pieces and lost the next two holes on mere bad play. On the twelfth, she hooked going into the trap. Miss Bly, it so happens, was also in the same trap and, playing first, attempted to mash you out. But the ball had insufficient pitch and caught the rim, rolling back in. Uh, profiting by Miss Bly's failure, Mrs. Preston changed her own mashie for a niblick and lofted out to the green. Miss Bly immediately picked up her ball. You lose the hole for that. For what? For looking at my club. That is, taking action which resulted in your receiving advice. And Rule 4, Section 1, provides that no player may ask for or take any action which may result in his receiving advice except from his caddy, his partner, or his partner's caddy. Penalty? Loss of hold. That's ridiculous. Perfectly ridiculous. Mr. Stander, what have you got to say about this? This, this nonsensical interpretation of the rule? Uh, tell her. I'm sorry, Mrs. Preston. Is that all you can say, that you're sorry? Why don't you tell the truth and say you take pleasure in deciding everything against me? Why don't you admit... Very it? well. Mrs. Preston... I am pleased to say that you lost this hole, as you've lost others before it. 
because of your habit of infringing not merely the code of good sportsmanship, but the letter and spirit of the rules of golf. Oh! I uh, will have to admit that my pronouncement so startled Mrs. Preston that her game went to pieces again. And on the next two holes, it was her score, not Miss Bly's, that nobody bothered to count. On the 15th, beginning to realize what was happening, she pulled herself together and played the hole, a short dog leg, wisely around the angle, letting Miss Bly beat herself by gambling unsuccessfully with a drive over some trees. She took the 16th and seemed destined to win the 17th and the match. When she put her approach shot no more than a foot from the cup, Miss Bly, who was on the green in nine, tried a long putt which trickled straight toward the hole, then hesitated and trembled to a stop. And uh, Mrs. Preston bent to tap in her own ball. She moved. Were you speaking to me? When I stroked my ball, she was standing close to the hole, and as the ball approached... She shifted position. Well, what if I did? There's no rule to prevent a player from moving. Oh, yes, there is. It's one of those rules seldom or never invoked before, like the one you quoted yesterday. But still good. What rule? Section 2 of Rule 29 provides that any player or caddy may stand at the hole, but no player or caddy shall endeavor to, by moving or otherwise to influence the action of wind upon the ball, the penalty for so doing being loss of the hole. You were at the hole and you moved, and nobody of your size can move without influencing the wind. Makes no difference that I was several strokes behind. The rule makes no exception, regardless of stroke count. The gallery was silent now, awed by the realization of the miracle they were witnessing. A rank beginner spotting a veteran six holes, then through the magic of nimble intelligence and an astounding memory pulling up neck and neck with her. The drama of the moment was only heightened by the lay of the last hole, a short but dangerous one. On its left was a swollen artificial water hazard, to its right, bad rough, and defending the green, deep bunkers. Miss Bly drove first. Into the hazard, Tom. Oh, well, I'll, I'll hate to see her resign from the club. Well, there's no stopping Mrs. Preston now. Mr. Sander, will you please inform the gallery that there is a rule about keeping quiet while a player is teeing off? Oh, yes, of course. Quiet, please. Mrs. Preston is teeing off. Into the rough. Well, that's not so bad. Hey, Bill, things are looking up again. Then Miss Bly dropped a ball on the other side of the hazard, then twice topped it into the water. Oh. Well, that's the end of Miss Bly. Too bad. Oh. But then, Mrs. Preston, overcautious, dumped her approach into one of the bunkers. Things are looking up again. Keep your fingers crossed, Bill. Then Miss Bly played her mashie and shot into the rough, taking nine to get on to the green. No more hope now. Then Mrs. Preston flubbed an explosion shot. She tried again, but the ball only went deeper into the sand. And then she did what numberless other golfers have done time out of mind. She went burst. No, no, I can't. I won't let it. I won't. Stroke five, stroke six, seven. By then, she was no longer a golf player, but a maddened savage. But the whims of golf are incalculable. She swung again for the eighth time, and the ball rose out of the bunker. It went high. It took a crazy sidewise dip and slithered down into the hole. For some moments, no one moved or spoke. Not even Mrs. Preston, who was as astonished as anyone. Mr. McTrevor was first to recover. Yeah, eight strokes. Mrs. Preston's hole, Mr. Stander. Her match also, I believe. Yes, I, I suppose so. Well, that is, I'm sorry, Miss Bly. Well, that was a nice shot, Mr. Stander. I'd be the last to deny she played it to perfection with lots of tailspin and everything... It's just too bad she didn't save it for some game that would mean something. This one doesn't. What? Uh, what did you say, Miss Bly? This game doesn't count. Doesn't count, Miss Bly? I just happened to remember that hole nine is only three and seven-eighths of an inch deep, as I told you yesterday. And that means the game will have to be played over in accordance with the precedent established by R&A Decision 206, 
which sustained a protest that an entire competition must be replayed because one of the holes was not of standard depth. Oh. Do you hear what I hear, George? I can hardly believe it. She's a magician, that girl. I, uh, I think you'd better tell Mrs. Preston, Mr. Standard. Do I? Do I have to, Miss Blythe? Well, you're the referee, according to the rules. The referee must act as liaison between players. Well, yes, yes, of, of course, Miss Bly, I understand. I'll tell her. Oh, Mrs. Preston. Mrs. Preston. Yes, what is it? I have something to tell you. That is... Yes, I know about Miss Bly. She will resign now, of course. I can't very well see what else there is left for her to do. Uh, no, it isn't that. You see, I'm afraid, Mrs. Preston, that the match will have to be played over again. What did you say, Mr. Yes, according to rule, that is, there is a rule. It's about the cup. It, it isn't of standard depth. You remember Miss Bly mentioning it to me yesterday. There is a rule which states that if the cup isn't of standard depth, the match must be replayed. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do, Mrs. Preston. You see... Never. Never. I shall never replay the game. I won. She must resign. I'm afraid you'll have to play it again, Mrs. Preston, according to the rules. Hang your rules. I'm sick of rules. Sick of them, do you hear? I shall never replay the match. I want nothing to do with it again. I wouldn't play with this Bly woman again to save my soul from Hades. I'll resign first. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll resign. I'm through. I don't want anything to do with this stuff again as long as I live. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Preston resigned from the club that same afternoon, and now we're back to normal again. Frankly, I can't say that I'm sorry. Mrs. Preston had position and standing, and I secretly nurtured a hope of a good connection with her husband. But uh, Miss Bly more than makes up for it with those red shorts. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much of a relief red shorts can be in our sedate setting. And that was for by Frank Buns. I hope you all enjoyed it. We sure did, Granny. Certainly did, Granny. Granny. And say, don't forget to be on hand next week for a real hilarious mad wrestling story entitled Reading, Writing, and Rosin. Well, see you all next week, fellas. Sure. Good luck, Bill. Good luck, Jack. Good Henry. This has been another visit to the Sportsman's Club for a favorite sports story of Grantland Rice. Today's story, Four, was dramatized for radio by Ben Kagan. Our actors were Marion Shockley, Charmé Allen, Cameron Prudholm, Bill Smith, Ian McAllister. George Crook was at the organ, and Grantland Rice was here in person. The production was under the direction of Herbert Rice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a message from your government. On June 7th last, D-Day plus one, selective service officials sent the following message to every draft board in the country. A shortage of licensed personnel and certified seamen has existed for some time. The shortage has been true of virtually all classes of mariners. Naval warfare makes this shortage particularly grave. Service in the merchant marine, considering its importance to the war effort, and the hazards involved, is so closely allied to service in the armed forces that men found by the local board to be actively engaged at sea may well be considered as engaged in active defense of the country. Such service may properly be considered as tantamount to military service. In this brief message is indicated the urgency of the need for recruiting in the merchant marine. One doesn't have to be an expert in logistics to realize that one day's delay in sailing because a ship is held up by lack of men can mean death and casualties for men at the front. Applicants can register immediately by wiring collect to the Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>